Welcome to Truth Triumphant Radio. I'm your host, Cody Mori, and today I wanted to talk about the subject of glorification. So, as we've gone through this little mini series here with the various stages going right, starting right from the, the point of where God draws us to Him, to repentance and confession of sin to the justification process, to the sanctification process, and then finally into the glorification process. And remember that we've done it in the context of the sanctuary. So essentially what God does is he draws you to his His sanctuary, spiritually speaking. He draws you to his sanctuary through his law and through his love. So through his messages of judgment, which cause people to realize that they are in a lost state and that they need a savior. And also the messages of love. So those two things combined. So you can't focus on too much on one or the other. There has to be a good balance between the two. His law and his love is what draws us. And that's why prophecy is so important because it points out. It points out his judgment. But it also points out how he has dealt with humanity throughout time. And how much patience he's had with us. And if he, he's drawing us to a sanctuary, we get to the point where we finally make that decision we need a savior and we we repent we, re we repent and we confess our sins not to man not to a priest but to to him to the father we repent forsake our sins and we ask for his forgiveness then we are entering into the sanctuary now we need a sacrifice because the the law needs to be paid for the wages of sin is death, as the Bible says. And we look for some help to find. If there might be some ransom payment available. And lo, there is the ram caught in the thicket that saved Isaac's life. I'm, of course, referring to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. No, he was not that ram in the thicket who was the uh, substitute for sacrifice uh, at that time, but he, he certainly is an object lesson is in there, referencing that, that very act, that God himself provided his own sacrifice. So that's the justification process is receiving actual pardon and the cleansing, the cleansing of the heart that takes place. Next, we moved over to the laver, where we followed Christ in baptism. And we followed him through baptism and through the, we focused as well on the, the specifically the water and the blood, which cleanses us, which points to continual renewal that he gives to us through his word and through, through connection to him. Next, we went into the first compartment of the sanctuary. No sin is in there. We, we, the, the saint, when you enter into sanctification, it's not, it's not, oh, I have unconfessed and unforsaken sins. No, those aren't there. True, true sanctification is holiness and wholeness for God, as Mrs. White had stated. And you have those, you have those pieces of furniture that are in there that help you to overcome sin. And if you look to your to your left you see the 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 menorah or the the golden candlestick the oil representing the holy spirit which is trimmed the morning and the evening and it gives light in the room and so we are supposed to witness and give light to others through the continual renewing of the holy spirit then you look over to your right and you see the table of showbread a crown around it signifying that Jesus Christ, one of the persons of the Godhead, is crowned king there as the table of showbread, which, which represents the daily bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread from heaven. He is the daily bread, the word of God, which we are to partake of each and every day. So these things, these things sustain us. These things give us strength and endurance to, to continue on. And then we look ahead and we see, we see the altar of incense there, 
which is mingled with the frankincense, which are the merits of Christ, which makes our, our prayers, which is what the smoke represents, makes our prayers acceptable to God. And who are those pairs, uh, prayers prepared by? None other than the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, which is why there's another crown. The second crown out of three in the sanctuary is there at the altar of incense. So we've learned about sanctification, the meanings, the meanings of justification. Now we enter into, as we move closer and closer towards God, as sin is being removed from us and we are moving closer towards God, we enter into the most holy place and stand before the mercy seat and the Shekinah glory. And the mercy seat has around it another crown representing the deity of the Father. So you have three crowns representing three kings or three persons of the Godhead right there in the sanctuary. It's just amazing. So that's where we left off last time. We're going to talk about what glorification is and what it means today. And I know that was quite an intro, but let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we ask for your cleansing in these last days. We ask that you would prepare your people, that time would not be continually delayed, that we wouldn't delay your coming by being unfaithful, by being unbelieving, Lord, but that we, we would lay everything on your altar, that we would grow up into the full stature of Jesus Christ, and that you would come, come to take us home. We ask that you'd help us as we do this study. In Jesus' name, amen. So, real quickly, I want to recap some of the high points of our last few topics because they're just so important. We just need to go over them a number of times. Repetition is very good on this. So I'm going to read again the devotional reflecting christ from march for, uh, 1st page 74 and mrs white explains what true justification is she says as the penitent sinner contrite before god discerns christ's atonement in his behalf and accepts this atonement as his only hope in this life and the future life his sins are pardoned this is justification by faith Every believing soul is to conform his will entirely to God's will and to keep in a state of repentance and contrition, exercising faith in the atoning merits of the Redeemer and advancing from strength to strength, from glory to glory. Pardon and justification are one in the same thing. Through faith, the believer passes from the position of a rebel, a child of sin and Satan, to the position of a loyal subject of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, not because of inherent goodness, but because Christ receives him as his child by adoption. The sinner receives the forgiveness of his sins. Because these sins are borne by the, his substitute and surety, the Lord speaks to his heavenly Father, saying, This is my child. I reprieve him from the, con con from the condemnation of death, giving him my life insurance policy, eternal life, because I have taken his place and suffered for his sins. He is even my beloved son. Thus man, pardoned and clothed with beautiful garments of Christ's righteousness, stands faultless before God. And so it's not just a declaration, though that is part of it. Your sins get forgiven and pardoned are one and the same thing. But if you notice when we read through this, it talked about how you go from a position of being a rebel to actually being in a position of a loyal subject of Christ. So that means that means that you will have laid all your sin at his feet and allow him to change the heart. When that happens, when true repentance of that of that level happens, the heart is cleansed. And that's really what justification is. It's being made into something holy, something set apart. So pardon, pardon, but so much more than pardon and justification. With sanctification, as we saw, no, no unconfessed or unforsaken sins abide with those who are going through the process of sanctification. So that means 
They are walking from strength to strength, just as the last quote says. And so what is true sanctification? Well, from the book Faith and Works, page 87, Mrs. White says this, True sanctification is nothing more or less than love than to love God with all the heart, to walk in his commandments and ordinances blameless. Sanctification is not an emotion, but a heaven-born principle that brings all the passions and desires under the control of the Spirit of God. And this work is done through our Lord and Savior. Amen. So, true sanctification is to actually be keeping his commandments and his ordinances blameless and what are the ordinances right a lot of folks will jump in see that's feast days no he left us ordinances we have the communion ordinance and we also have the baptism ordinance those are two ordinances so sanctification no unconfessed or unforsaken sins are permitted when you think about it as a priest walking into the actual tabernacle, if he was to walk into the first compartment of the tabernacle, approaching very nigh into the very throne of God with sin, he would have been struck dead. And as a matter of fact, we have an example of that in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu, for offering strange fire to the Lord, right? They walked into that sanctuary with sin. They had unconfessed and unforsaken sins what happened to them they perished they perished for their for their rashness and their boldness and their high-handedness and so there is a point of no return so don't play with sin but i also want to point out third selected messages page 172 this is something that we had talked about as well the message of righteousness by faith, it actually is the third angel's message. And if it is the third angel's message, then it is the last message to the world, but also particularly to the church. And so it's a message that goes to the church. And if we look at the messages in Revelation chapter 3, with the messages of the church to the to Laodicea, we see those same elements. We see the, the gold of faith tried in the fire we see the white raiment of christ's righteousness that's righteousness by faith right there and discernment and this is this is given under the the in the in the way of a rebuke towards the church and so it can it can be said through these connections here that it's actually the message of righteousness by faith which is which is the heart and soul of the third angel's message ironically which causes the shaking in the church. So the folks that end up on the wrong side of this message will be shaken out. The third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. This is, again, third selected messages, page 172. The commandments of God have been proclaimed, but the faith of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as of equal importance the law and the gospel going hand in hand. I cannot find language to express this subject in its fullness. The faith of Jesus, it is talked of, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message? Jesus becoming our sin bearer, that he might become our sin pardoning savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins that we might take his righteousness and faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. So it's a faith that overcomes the world, folks. It's a faith that we understand where we come to the, the we actually believe we can overcome sin fully to the point of perfection. That he can take our sinfulness and we can take his righteousness by faith. And then be able to keep his commandments. No, we won't be running around saying we're sinless. Of course not. The Holy Spirit will never inspire somebody to do such a thing. But sinlessness is a real, tangible, achievable goal. And it, it's a must if you want to reach the maturity of faith, which is what glorification is. Glorification is 
the maturity of faith, the full stature of Christ. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. We're asked to be perfect in the same way that God is. Well, what, which way is God perfect? Of course, this is speaking of his moral perfection. He's perfect in every way, of course. But we can't be perfect like him. He can't ask us to be perfect in intelligence. It's not achievable. If you were as if you were as perfect in your intelligence of the universe as is God, you would be God. So what's it talking about? Well, the context of this passage in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, is moral perfection. He's calling people to live different lives. So why would, why would Jesus say, be perfect even as your Father which in he is in heaven is perfect, if it was something that is not achievable? Or maybe the word perfect means something else. So I looked it up. In the Strong's Concordance, it's number 5046, perfect. The word is teleos in the Greek. It means perfect man of full age, brought to its end, finished, Right? So some a Christian who is, who is brought to their end, a Christian who's finished, if Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, what does that look like? What does it look like when the, when the overcomer's work is done? What does that mean? Well, obviously, it's a no-brainer. It means that they're morally perfect. It means that they are sinless. It means what it says it means the uh the definition goes on it says wanting nothing necessary to completeness perfect that which is perfect so when this is saying this it's it's telling what it's telling you essentially is this you are a sinner hopelessly helplessly lost in sin you cannot overcome you cannot fight against the devil you cannot change your ways you can't change your lusts eventually you'll give in to them even if you're able to reform your outward habits inwardly you would be the same you'd be dead inside that's true Everything I just said is true. But then, when we look to Jesus Christ and we say, take my sinlessness, we repent and we confess our sins. And we say, cleanse my heart as David did. Take my wretchedness, take my sinfulness and give me your righteousness. When he does that, and he answers that prayer when we accept him as our substitutionary sacrifice. And then we begin to follow his example of his sacrifice by dying to self each and every day. And growing from strength to strength. Where does that battle eventually lead? Well, it leads to a point where you are keeping the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. That's what it means. It means that you will live a life of righteousness by faith. But it's not your righteousness because, as I stated in the beginning, you're hopelessly, helplessly lost. It's his righteousness. Thus, no man can boast. But his righteousness is a perfect righteousness. So if we're in perfect submission and obedience to him, then we can overcome. And some folks will turn around and say, well... You know, we can never overcome because, because we have a carnal nature and that nature is, you know, the same each and every day. And yeah, that's part of that's true. But Review and Herald, April of 1902 says this, He, Christ, came to this world and lived a sinless life that in his power his people might also live lives of sinlessness. He desires them by practicing the principles of truth 
to show to the world that God's grace has power to sanctify the heart. Did you hear that? We can be empowered also to live lives of sinlessness just as Jesus did. That's the power that he offers to us. That's the the privilege, the prize that he offers to us. And in these last days, it's not just a privilege or an honor, but it's a requirement, especially in these last days, because in these last days, only those will be saved as part of the 144,000 who have achieved full stature, who have achieved Christian maturity. And Mrs. White states that. But before we go there, I want to read another quote on sinlessness. This is from Christian Experience and Teaching, page 189. Mrs. White says, Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. It is left to us, left with us to remedy the defects in our characters. You hear that? It's left with us, which means what? Human effort will be involved. Human effort and divine power. He gives us, he gives us power to overcome, but we have to work too. No, no, we're not working for salvation. We're fighting the fight, the good fight of faith. That's what we're doing, and we're called to do that. It says, It is left with us to remedy the defects in our character, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples in the day of Pentecost. There you have it. In the last days, Mrs. White says this, she says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. This fruit can never perish, but will produce after its kind a harvest unto eternal life. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle. And because the harvest is come, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself. In his church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people then he will come to claim them as his own Christ object lessons page 68 and 69 and then we also have review and Herald January 17th 1907 it says those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent efforts, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people on earth I know I mean what's crazy about this is that's so clear his character Christ's character will be perfectly reproduced in his people what does that mean that means moral perfection right and then you read this next quote it says the intercessions shall cease we will stand without a mediator our robes must be spotless our characters must be purified by sin or from sin from every sin overcomers to the fullness of that of that term of what's desired of God and people spit they take this and spin this you know it's interesting because mrs. white says in other places that the most the most basic understanding of what you're trying to read is usually the correct one and that's how we should interpret scripture and yet people people will they're they're Olympic level theologians they'll take this and twist this and try to say what it clearly is not saying. They'll say things like, and I've heard Walter Vyth say this, that you got to be perfect in your sphere, which is different 
it's very clearly what he's saying is it's different than than actual full perfection. This is from Review and Herald, February 26, 1901, that, that you can pull. There's many quotes like this, but this is one example that people try to use. It says, strive to make decided improvement. Cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord, being neat and tidy in your dressing, kind and courteous in your manner. Be pure and refined, for heaven is the very essence of purity and refinement. As God is pure and holy in his sphere, so we are to be in our sphere. And folks, I will tell you, yes, you absolutely have to be perfect in your sphere. But that means moral perfection. That means sinlessness in whatever sphere you have. And because not all of us have the same temptations, right? If you are a governor, or if you are a monarch, or if you are a banker, or if you are a tradesman, a skilled laborer, a janitor, uh, a teacher. You have different types of temptations, right? So what this is basically saying is that you have to overcome every single temptation, trial that is that is in your path, but you're not you're not going to be tested on on temptations that don't apply to you. Some might perhaps be a very easy temptation for you because you're so far removed from it or some of these some of these temptations that kings and things have to deal with you might be wholly unprepared for and so all this is saying is to be perfect in your sphere meaning he's not going to hold you to some crazy standard of perfection in the sense of trials and 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 temptations and tribulations even that would apply to someone in a totally different situation. But you need to overcome everything in your situation, situation, which is still sinless perfection. Perfect moral character, the full stature of Jesus Christ. So in closing, we will quote one more quote from the Spirit of Prophecy where she says, you must overcome every single tendency to evil. This is from Signs of the Times. July 18th, 1895. It says, Those who reign with Christ in his kingdom must have a fellowship in his suffering. Every defect in character condemned by the law of God must, through the grace of Christ, which is freely given to every soul who desires it, be overcome. Every defect. Let me read that one more time. Every defect in character condemned by the law of God must, through the grace of Christ, which is freely given to every soul who desires it, be overcome. Doesn't sound like we're allowed to sin right up into the second coming, does it? Every hereditary and cultivated tendency to evil must be seen, subdued, and cleansed, that the soul temple may be fit for the indwelling of the Spirit of God. The divine will must be accepted and the human will brought into harmony with God, though it cause bigger, bitter agony and tears. Traits of character that are offensive to God are often very dear to man, and are cherished as virtues. How blind is humanity unless the light of heaven is accepted and cherished. When truth is laid hold of resolutely, and a firm, determined purpose is cherished to bring the life into harmony with truth, then is cultivated the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Then the disciples of Christ manifest that steadfastness of purpose, that will not fail nor be discouraged. God will bestow his gifts to the, to the striving soul in proportion to his willingness to receive and his readiness to impart for the glory of God. There you have it, folks. Let's have a word of prayer as we close this out. Clearly, we can see what the spirit of prophecy is saying to us on this issue of glorification and being before the throne of God. Father in heaven, we desire, we desire to, to be in your presence. We desire to enter into, spiritually speaking, the most holy place. To be before you and your throne one day. Help us to abide. Help us to abide in you. Help us to submit to you, to obey you. 
to trust you, to believe the things that you've told us. Help us to believe, Lord, that we can be overcomers, to believe that you love us so much that you're willing to pardon, that you're willing to forgive and give us another chance. Help us believe to have a faith that overcomes the world. Help us to believe unto salvation, to believe unto perfection, to, do, to believe unto sinlessness, to believe like Jesus believed, and to trust in you. May we be your people that you speak of throughout Revelation, that keep your commandments, that have the testimony of Jesus and the faith of Jesus, that have a right to the tree of life. That is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you've been listening to Truth Triumphant Radio. We'll catch you next time. God bless.